Bye bye, Shemaza here. Had some time on my hands, thought I'd make a short little clip explaining a topic that people have asked about. What is a heretic? Now, we have to understand that the idea of a heretic halakhically really doesn't mean anything. It's more of a social construct. How so? Well, it rarely appears in the Mishnah. Uh, it really got its legs by the Amorayim uh, in the Gemara. Uh, just because uh, with all the division in Israel, as they were being occupied by Rome, you had a lot of splinter groups rising up, mainly because the Beis and the Sanhedrin didn't have as much power as they used to. Uh, so there's a lot of questions that they failed to answer. So this gave birth to sectarianism. Now sectarianism in itself is not bad as long as it doesn't contradict halakha. Right? I think the closest thing we have in halakha uh, an actual an actual halakha to an actual heretic is the notion of a zakin mamre. Uh, the Ramam has a whole book on this. It's called Hilchas Mamre. Uh, a zakin mamre is a rebellious elder. Now, this appears black and white as halakha, uh, that this type of individual is put to death because, one, he has a high status in the Jewish community. That means he's one of the zakenim. He's one of the the leaders of the generation, he most likely has smicha, and he's going against, he's directly going against, a ruling brought down by the court. All right? Not that he personally disagrees. This is one thing that these uh, guys online who constantly call everybody a heretic don't understand, that there is no religious test in terms of belief in the Jewish world. Right? You could technically believe what you want. It's what you do both in keeping the written law and the oral law. It's what you do. The oral law, specifically what we know as halakha le maseh, right? Because that's um, what we discuss more, just because there's more of it. So, there is no actual din as a heretic, no status as a heretic in Jewish law, but the notion of a zakin mamre, that someone who actually has a stature, uh, who can do damage um, in the Jewish world, teaches contrary to what the court Instruct. So if the court, the Sanhedrin, tells Israel to go right, and they, he specifically not believes that they should go left, but publicly teaches others to go left, contrary to what the court says, that person is liable the death penalty. That's it. Now, the idea of a heretic is really premature in the Mishnah. Now the notion, even of a min in the Mishnah, really deals with the Arba meaning, right? The four species. It's always practical. It's always typically tied to an actual mitzvah in the Torah. Uh, but anyways, when someone calls someone a heretic nowadays, I mean, honestly, what charge would they bring to the court, right? He's a heretic in what, right? Because what, what it really means nowadays is that you're going against what's popular. And it, clearly things were... Uh, Things that were popular in the time of the Rambam were not popular now, just like things that were popular in the time of Rabbi Kiva are not things that are popular now. Clearly, Rabbi Kiva existed amongst us. Nowadays, he would also be labeled a heretic by these other rabbis, just because they don't really understand how the hierarchy in Judaism works, right? It's Bryce's Mishnah, and then there's everything else. In other words, what makes you a Jew is believing in the five books of Moses, specifically the laws in the five books of Moses, to do them, and believing in halakha lemaseh, what appears in the Mishnah from people who had actual smicha. Not people who are commenting about it, right? Uh, but the actual source material brought down by Tanaim and before. Now, Amoraim do bring a lot to the table, but mainly when they're quoting uh, another Tana, when they bring a Brisa, that's really what Talmud brought Bavli brought to the table. They brought down all these prices, reminding us that, you know what, there's other portions of the Shnake literature that we may have overlooked. So, when someone calls you a heretic, don't feel so bad. First of all, it's just a way to write you off. It means that they don't want to debate you or they cannot debate you because the term really doesn't mean anything nowadays. Now, colloquially, people don't want to deal with anyone labeled as a heretic, but this is why it's really the, fir the worst form of Lashonara out there, Motsi Shemra out there, because it gets people to write you off and feel like they um, shouldn't dialogue with you or debate with you. Uh, but the truth is, the vast majority of people who use that term heretic don't know how Jewish law functions in general. I mean, don't really know much about Jewish history, which I think is essential to understanding Yahadut in general. Understanding or having a clear chronological understanding 
of Jewish history, and especially when all these laws were introduced like this, you're able to, to distinguish between Minhagim, Halachot, uh, anyways. Um, so that is the bulk of what I had to say of the notion of what a heretic is. Now, this is another thing I wanted to talk about, the notion of the Yud Gimel Karamuda, the Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith, right? Um, it's been colloquially understood since the Rambam. Now, you have to understand who the Rambam was. The Rambam is important to us because of Mishneh Torah, essentially. Right? Also for his Persian Mishnah Yod, for his commentary to the Mishnah, uh, but mainly uh, for Mishneh Torah, which is his codification of all of Jewish law. That means his personal opinions, which I would say is maybe 6% of what uh, what is in Mishneh Torah, uh, we appreciate, although we understand that it is optional to believe, right? Because again, he was an Atana, he didn't have smicha. Um, he's appreciated for what he brought to the table, what he brings to the table, but his personal opinions are just that, personal opinions. People nowadays make no distinction between a rabbi's personal opinions and when they're just reiterating Chazal. So, uh, for example, there's been a debate in the Jewish world for a while now, what's a Jew actually required to believe? So the understanding is, let's say, from the corner of the Radbaz. So the Radbaz teaches that a Jew really doesn't have to believe in anything, he just has to keep Torah. Rabbi Yosef uh, Albo in, um, in Sefer Harikaram, he says that a Jew must believe in three things. It flips my mind exactly what those, strings, those three things are. And it, we all know the Rambam's 13 principles. Uh, that was the Rambam's rendition on what a Jew must believe. Now, there's a great book on this topic by Rabbi Mark Shapiro. I believe he's a Wayu Musmach. He's, uh, I think he's either Rosh Hashiva or just a rabbi or Magid Shir in, in, uh, like in Yeshiva Scranton. But he writes a book called The Limits of Orthodox Theology. And there he brings down many sources of rabbis who disagreed with the Rambam's enumeration of, of any um, set of laws or, or ideas that people must believe in because it was very controversial for him to make that statement. Now, it's not that we ridicule people who believe like the Rambam does. Heck, I believe and I would say 99% of what he brings down there in Perkhalik. And just to be accurate, actually Rabbi David Bachayim had a whole video on this that the Yud Gimel Karamuna that we have nowadays, which is pretty similar to what appears in Yigdao and the Animamim, is not really what the Rambam wrote. That's an abridgment that actually nobody knows who compiled. To really know what the Rambam had to say of the 13 principles, you had to go back to his Hakdama to Parachalik, which is where they got the synopsis of the 13 principles. Uh, he, he challenged, uh, to quote Rabbi David, David Rahim, I hope I quote him accurately, he challenged the notion that one must await Mashiach daily. Right? That's sort of you know, it's sort of antithetical to Judaism to assume that Mashiach should come every minute when one Israel hasn't done tshuva. I mean, the state of Jews nowadays to assume that God is just going to redeem them just because time is ticking down seems almost contrary to the message we see in Torah, right? Teshuvah is everything. First, Israel has to do teshuva. But anyways, yeah, he proved that that's not what it really said. That's the, that's what it says in the abridgment we have. That's what it says in Yigdal, but that's not what it says in the actual 13 principles. Um, and I make the same argument with Tehiyat HaMeitim. What is, is brought down as Tehiyat HaMeitim, if you understand it contextually as the Rambam taught it, it is not what people actually believe nowadays regarding Tehiyat HaMeitim, the resurrection of the dead, according to the Rambam. First of all, the Rambam was accused first of not believing in the resurrection of the dead, which is why he had to write a whole treatise uh, saying, yes, I do believe in it, right? Uh, almost giving people what they wanted to hear, because he excludes it from Hilchot Melachim, where it should appear in Mishneh Torah. I mean, he slightly mentions it in Hilchot Teshuvah, but chronologically where it should appear, alongside the laws of Mashiach and the end of days and all that stuff, uh, the Rambam excludes it. So when he says, sure, I, I believe in it, he basically says, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the way that people resurrect just to die again, which is basically contrary to what everyone else believes, right? The Ramban teaches that it's a perpetual resurrection. That, Similar to Mashiach, the, the Rambam also believes that Mashiach will eventually die and his kid will take over and on and on, and it, this is still conditional. 
right? If uh, Israel screws up again, they're going to Galut again. That's contrary to what many rabbis teach about Yom HaMashiach, and it's perpetual, it's never going to end. This, and that means God's essentially going to give everyone a lobotomy that they won't be able to sin anymore, which would be the only way that, according to Torah, we would remain in, in, in any perpetual redemptive state. But anyways, this shows that even with the notion of Tehiyat Meitim, the resurrection of the dead on the Rambam, it's not as clear as the way people teach it nowadays. So it, it's easy to say, oh, well, you're going against the Rambam's 13 principles, but they themselves are actually going against it in many different ways, not just the 13 principles, but the Rambam in general, right? If the average Kabbalist, who let's say would point his finger at me and say, oh, well, I'm a heretic because I happen not to adhere to what this Godel said, or in particular the Rambam, you know what, that according to the Rambam, virtually every Hasid, every Kabbalist, I mean, for sure, every Lurianic Kabbalist would be held in content and as a heretic because the anthropomorphic rep representations of God, of him having a leg, uh, an arm, a sense of humor, the notion of God even being a king is contrary to the Rambam, right? I mean, even though the Rambam himself contradicts himself, he talks about God living in a palace, that's also some sort of anthropomorphic understanding. Uh, in terms of limitations of God, why does the Rambam have problem, a huge problem with Trinitarians? It's because to split God into pieces is to limit God. What do you think the Partsufim and the Sefirot and the Atzilut and Tzimtzum, all these notions would put you on the Rambam's bad list? Uh, people don't understand this. I think this is my strength when I do my debates. I bring up sources that are easily researchable, but that just people don't know about because people get tunnel vision when they study halakha. They, they, they typically hold by one rabbi or one gadol, and they think that if you disagree with that gadol, you're disagreeing with gadole hador, like all oh, the gadolim nowadays. That's, that's, it's, it's very short-sighted. It's actually not true. And it really shows that they just pick and choose as well. Uh, or the demagogue when they say, oh, Chazal teach, or the rabbis teach. There's no consensus on what the rabbis teach, okay? The only consensus is that we have to listen to the rulings of the court, right? Parshat Shoft in Deuteronomy chapter 17, the mitzvah of lo tasur, of not straying from this court. That's really what Elu Ve'elu Diver Lechim Chaim actually means, right? Elu Ve'elu, that all these opinions brought down by Tanaim who have smicha, that all these are the opinions of the living God because the understanding is that you can't stray from the right up to the left of what this court rules. Now, it's true, in the time of Hillel and Shammai, the, the din was many times split into two. No one actually knew which way to go, but the understanding is that anyone who passed outside of Hazal was considered, I guess to use your favorite word, a heretic or someone outside of the fold. Uh, but it's fine, right? Um, but, you're still keeping all the commandments as they were meant to be kept, i.e. living and memorizing the five books of Moses and adhering to halakha, no matter how ambiguous those halachot may seem. Because that's what the mitzvah of lo tasur means, of not straying or the prohibition that one shouldn't stray. You're adhering to, to, to one understanding, right? Judaism as it functions today, it's really Rambam Judaism. Okay, hands down, that's the way it works. We go by the Rambam's Masora, on what the final halachot actually are. This is why Shulchan Aruch is not really a codification of Jewish law, it's a compilation of Jewish law, right? The Rambam was a codifier, the Machaber was a compiler. He compiled the best out of three, the Rosh, the Rif, and the Rambam. There's not much beef between the Rambam and the Rif. He says that he could count, I believe, in two hands how many times he actually disagrees with the Rif, right? I think the bigger beef is between the Rosh in the Rambam saying, teaching us uh, that people had a different Masorah on how to understand Chazal, but it didn't really matter as long as you went by the rulings of the court. People have, have to understand that Judaism was not really formulated uh, in the time of, like, of the Amorim and even in the time of the Tanaim, but actually before. This system was put in place way before the Yanshe Knesset Gedola, way before uh, like Sefer Shoftim. This is, I mean, this was put in place in the time of Zakanim and Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay, it, it, so it, it, like, only because an Amara may, may teach a, a certain idea, or even a late Tana teach another idea, it doesn't change the way Judaism functions. Judaism, in a nutshell, is the five books of Moses and Halakha. What is Halakha? Now, Halakha has nothing to do with belief. It has nothing to do with folklore and legend. It, it, it ultimately deals with laws ruled into existence by the court. 
ruled into existence by the court. That means, by definition, that it cannot contain anything metaphysical because if the court had the authority to institute anything metaphysical, wouldn't they just institute that the Messiah should come tomorrow or that our enemies should be drowned in the sea? Of course they had no power. This is clear. The Rambam writes this in the uh, Hilchah Sanhedrin that the, that the power of the court only existed via voting that they would vote things into existence. The greatest hachamam of the generation will get together and vote. Now, one error that many people make is that that power does not extend to rabbis nowadays. Rabbis nowadays have no judicial power in the Jewish world. Now, it's a great thing uh, to have uh, a Rav Mufhak or have different rabbim. I think this is what a Asalech HaRav really means, to bounce your idea of many, of many knowledgeable people. Right? A rabbi, a supposed posek, there's no real status of a posek nowadays. No one could really create halakha for the Jewish people. However, a community does have the right to establish a posek for themselves. I mean, someone who's going to decide which way the halakha is going to go for that community. And that's essentially what you have nowadays. If you live in Brooklyn and, uh, I don't know, that you have a problem with... with, with uh, what Rav David Cohen brings to the table, then, I don't know, go to Muncie. Like, Davin in a different shul, right? If you don't like the rulings of one community or the customs of one community, go to a different community. Now, this is not really possible when the ruling came down from the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin ruled for all of Israel. And so, it's not all or nothing. This is why it's hard to explain this in a two-minute lecture. And uh, people really get stuck in what's called, to quote Thomas Sowell, first stage thinking. And Judaism really can't be explained with little sound bites because those in the religious world who teach like I do won't say that that, that Rav Yosef had no power, that Rav Avada Yosef had no power. No, even though we make a distinction between actual smicha that ended uh, in around the beginning of the 5th century and what we have nowadays, which is really a form of smicha that was invented in 1538 of the Common Era. Even though we make a distinction, we don't belittle the leaders of the generation, whether you want to call them Godoylem, whether you want to call them Sadiqim, we don't belittle them. However, we do say that their rulings are only binding on those who accept those rulings as binding, not binding on, on all the Jewish people. That's one thing these guys don't understand, that because I happen to disagree with Rabbi Mizrahi or Rabbi Yerun Reuven on a small area, I'm sure we agree more than we disagree, they have the chutzpah to call you a heretic. That's not how Judaism functions, really. You have to be pretty detached from the Jewish world to come to a conclusion that you're going to call someone a name just because they don't hold like you do religiously. Judaism, especially people who've lived in Israel, know how colorful and how diverse the Jewish people really are. There's different opinions, right? But I guess you don't pick that up unless you've lived in Israel. And that's probably the, the biggest advantage I've had um, or the thing that has equipped me the most to not just relate to the Jewish people, but to teach Torah is living in Israel. I lived in Israel for five years. I was in yeshiva for about two of those years, but I was a Makarv in Hebrew and I've met tons of rabbis and I've discussed my ideas with many other people. As a matter of fact, discussing my ideas is really what has refined them. I learned with Timanim, I learned with Ashkenazim. It, 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 Israel is a true theological melting pot. However, when you spend too much time in America, you start thinking that you're the only sheriff in town which really makes you look like an amateur because it, it, it shows how you are not aware that the Talmud is a sea or Mishnaic literature is a sea of, of, of knowledge of, of, in many cases, binding halachot that uh, may be binding to you and not binding to other people because that person may hold by another Bryce or another Tana. All right. Um, but anyways... I think I should keep this video a little short. Guys, you know, for everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.com. Hit my classes up every Monday night at 9.30 live. Also, we're doing classes every every Saturday night at 11.30. Right, This is a class that uh, my good friend Dr. Abraham created for students in India, but everyone is welcome to join. Thank you and be well.